Okay, I think we can get started. Um, so welcome everyone to the science pipeline session. Uh, I'm Colin Slater, I'm the deputy DM sub scientist and I'll be doing the moderation role for this session. Um, so first, just some friendly reminders. Um, we all agreed to a set of principles for how we would conduct this meeting. Um, so we should all remind ourselves to continue to abide by those principles in this session today. Uh, next slide. Uh, as another reminder that all talks will be recorded, um, the video will be posted uh, sometime in the next 24 hours. So if you do not want to be recorded, uh, turn off your camera and microphone. Uh, next, please. We have a Slack channel set up. Um, so we really encourage questions to go to Slack because that'll be a good way for us to continue the discussion uh, after the end of the hour today. Um, Feel free to ask questions at any time, but the main Q&A section will be really after the end of all the talks. Um, and I'll note that we have lots of uh, pipelines experts online who are, are ready to give you all the details you could want about some of the algorithms we'll be talking here, talking about here. So um, we'll try to get as many questions answered as we can, um, but uh, if we don't uh, have time to get to your question, I assure you we will, we will get you an answer um, uh, via Slack or online, and so um, do not worry. Uh, so with that, I will hand it over to Yusra, who will dive in. Thank you, Colin. I'm going to be speaking on behalf of the whole Science Pipelines team. You're going to hear other voices as well, Lee Kelvin and Meredith Rawls on science validation, Arun Kanawati on galaxy photometry and new ways to measure galaxy colors. Siegfried Egel on solar system algorithms, and Eric Bellum, our alert production scientist on updates to image differencing. Not everybody was at team meeting the day that I took this photo or turned their camera on, and not everybody on the Science Pipelines team is here here today. Jim Bosch, our data release production scientist, is still on leave. So we are scientists first. We're all in science collaborations and we have the same goals as you do. We're all excited about the science that we're gonna do once Ruben comes online. What we have in common is that we're all currently writing the software that's gonna take the raw images coming off of Ruben and process them and extract as much information as possible out of this multi-epoch variable petabyte data stream and provide data products that we can do with science. Those data products include both catalogs and images. We expect the majority of science to be possible with catalogs. However, we know that you are going to invent new science that cannot be done from the catalogs alone. And therefore, the images are also going to be first class data products that you can use to find your ultra diffuse galaxies, do your shift and stack algorithms to find planet nine, and I would see it as a major success of Ruben if people were running novel science pixel level algorithms for decades to come. While we are as not as bold as to say that we have already know all science that will be possible in the next decade, we are as bold to say that we, we do not think you should have to redo instrument signature removal or PSF estimation. And if decisions get tough during commissioning, we promise that we are gonna focus on those more core parts of the pipeline because we are closer to the instrument. We're gonna get these images and catalogs to you in two ways, fast and slow. Fast are the annual nightly alert stream to support science that requires rapid follow-up. Slow are the annual data release products to support static sky science and statistical studies of variability. So a common misconception that I hear over and over is that image differencing is only gonna occur during alert production. That is not true. Um, image differencing is part of the data releases as well. Four sources, uh, where light curves are a data product of data release production. And we are going to provide those light curves to you in the four source table, which will be computed by taking the positions of detections in both image differencing and deep coads, and then force photometering those on both the difference images and uh, and single visit images or the, the calyx for process visit images as we call them. So we go 
we enter in operations in two and a half years. And so we have a pipeline in place now. But this won't necessarily be the exact same pipeline that we go on Sky with at the start of operations because the we, we are committed to providing state-of-the-art image processing algorithms. And the state-of-the-art has changed a lot, at least since we've started construction years ago. And we expect it to continue to change uh, going into the future as well. And so not only, not only do we expect to have a different pipeline in two years, but we also expect the pipelines to evolve through operations as well. The, the pipelines used to produce data release five will not necessarily be the same ones that we use to, data, to process data release one. So if we don't have LSS TCAM data now, how do we know that the pipelines are performing well? How do we, how do we validate the, the existing science pipelines? Well, we, use precursor data from other cameras to analyze the pipeline performance. We use, um, we use three wide field cameras, one simulated and two real. The simulations that we're focusing on are from Desk's Data Challenge 2 Run 2.2i. Simulated data is good because you have truth catalogs and the geometry is the same as LSST cam. Simulations, what they don't have are all the gory artifacts that real data has, like satellite trails and scattered light from bright stars and bad amps. For that, we use real data. We focus on using DCAM and HSC. DCAM, and the, both these cameras have roughly a quarter of the pixels that LSST will, are their, their wide field. And what DCAM is great for is it doesn't have a uh, atmospheric dispersion corrector, just like LSST won't, which makes it excellent for testing how the pipelines respond to differential chromatic refraction. What Hypersuprime Cam offers us is it's it's really deep and as as deep as we expect from LSST. So one one visit of HSC is approximately two year wide fast deep depth depth. This is a, a co-ed that you're looking at made by Nate, which is approximate, approximately a, a 10 year wide fast deep depth of, of LSST. Um, and you can see that at these depths, a lot of the assumptions and intuition that you may have developed for shadow or shallower surveys just doesn't hold at these depths. Another feature is that the, the Rubin science pipelines are the Hypersuprime Cam Strategic Survey Program pipelines. That is, we are we are using the Rubin pipelines to produce those data releases. And this has been this has been um, invaluable feedback for, for the team. So we process these data sets of three different sizes on three different cadences. I'll start with, I'll go through each of these in turn. We process hundreds of square degrees on an annual cadence. And this, this is great for testing all of data management and finding rare edge cases. If there's an issue that pops up in one out of every million images, then you need to process a million images before you find one of these that you can fix. We do this in the form of external data releases and internal reprocessing campaigns. So like I said, the, the Rubin science pipelines are used for the external Hypersuprime Cam data releases. Two of those have been made so far. Um, if you go to the, the PDR2 website I have linked here, it'll take you to a page with a ton of QA plots. One of the reasons why it's really necessary to test on hundreds of square degrees is that you can see spatial patterns that, that appear that would not be visible in smaller smaller patches. So for example, if you pull up one of the plots on this website, it'll show you the mean declination offset of our astrometric solution compared to Gaia. And there's these red, <laughs> these little red patches that pop up where you can see that our, our, apps, uh, our measurement was just slightly north of what Gaia's positions are. And the, the reason for this is simple. These were uh, this data set was processed in 2018 when we were tying our astrometry to pan stars. 
and pan stars shows this offset compared to Gaia. So since then, of course, uh, we've added the Gaia reference catalogs to the science pipelines, and we now tie joint cal. Joint cal is our uh, relative global astrometric calibration algorithm. We now tie that to Gaia instead of answers. We have another data release coming out this fall. The main difference there is that it's going to include it's, it will have used the forward global calibration method for photometric calibration. Beyond that, we are also releasing DP0.2 on desk DC2 IMSIM data. This is going to be run on generation three middleware and include the, the new difference imaging branch of the data release pipeline. This is on the, on the fence of whether you can call it internal or external because we, didn't, we don't have the resources to provide accounts for everybody, but we are, we're going to slowly ramp up the number of accounts that we can support in the, in the following years. For internal processing campaigns, these are useful for integrating all of data management, including the middleware, the, that's the software that runs the software. And um, we've, we generally reprocess the, the public data releases from HSC the year after they come out. This is, this is not for science, but just for internal validation. The next one of these we have planned is this winter, we will reprocess the PDR2 data set with Gen3, the same, the same data, uh, the same pipeline that we're using for DP0.2. The reason that we're reusing PDR2 instead of reprocessing PDR3 is that when you compute metrics on data products, you can test one of two things. You can test the image quality, and you can also test the pipeline quality. To test the image quality, you hold your pipelines fixed and vary your images. To test the image quality, sorry, to test your pipeline quality, you hold your images fixed and vary your pipeline. And that's what we're doing now. We want a direct apples to apples comparison with 2020. Along those same lines, we also run 10 square degrees every month. And this is a fabulous test bed for new algorithms. So for the same, for the same reason, we, we want to test, our pipeline is rapidly evolving. We, we make changes all month long. And we want to test the, the changes in the pipeline and ignoring image, image issues. And for this reason, we use a very well-defined designed um, subset of data, sorry, got distracted by Slack, of data that is familiar to us. And when we see changes to the metrics, we know that it's due to the pipeline and not, uh, and not image quality. So we have dashboards and chronograph that compute metrics. We also have plots that get monitored every month as well. And we, we meet and discuss the, the changes that we see. So one example of this, one metric that we have on chronograph are Lee's new sky objects. Yeah, you can see that there is, uh, this is the standard deviation of, of the sky object flux. Sky objects are just extra rows that we insert in the database that are positions that are randomly placed on empty patches of sky. And so we can measure the mean and standard deviation of these to evaluate how our um, background subtraction is doing. So you can see right after we turned on Scarlet, there was this big dip in the sky objects. The standard deviation became unrealistically low. We were able to do some debugging, trace that back to how Scarlet handles very faint objects differently. And we're able to adjust the, the flags and have it come pack, uh, pop back up to normal. Okay, thank you, uh, Yusra, for all of the initial part of this. Uh, I'm going to briefly speak about um, some of the work that uh, that we do when we run the alert production pipeline, specifically uh, to do uh, on, on kind of these medium scale data sets. So, as as Yusra said, uh, this helps us to kind of figure out uh, how changes in our pipelines will affect the results that we get uh, when we when you run everything through like all the way from raw images, all the way through to, um, to difference imaging and uh, 
and making some kind of database of all of the sources at the end of it. So what I'm showing here uh, on the right is uh, some of the locations of the different imaging sources that we found um, in one of the, the medium data sets, the, the DCAM hits data set. And because there's three different uh, fields on the sky in this data set, uh, I plotted all of them on top of each other to see like if there's any particular weirdness happening in focal plane coordinates. Um, and you can see there's like a bad column that stands out. Uh, so that can help us kind of drill down and figure out um, if, if the plot that I made here is different from the plot that I made a month or two ago, then that you know tells something changed and we should look into it. On the bottom, I'm showing an example of uh, how we can filter out some of the quote unquote bad objects or sources just because we can tell if you know it's sort of the edge of a chip or it's a um, uh, we know that it's a bad column, uh, for example, then you can just say immediately any source in that area on the chip, like, throw that out. So what I'm calling a filtered object or a good object here is uh, is something that does not have a source that is that is pretty obviously spurious. Um, and so it's interesting to look at the the objects, as you you may recall, are kind of the once individual detections on images are called sources, and then those are associated together into real astrophysical objects. So you can take a look at the distribution in the lower left here. You can see there's a whole bunch of uh, of objects that are composed of just a couple sources, and then that kind of trails off uh, as you as you increase, you know, depending on how many visits you have, uh, you'll get a kind of a long tail there for. Uh, some of the objects are variable in every single visit and some of them um, are not. So that's kind of interesting. Go to the next one, please. Thanks. So we also do uh, smaller data set reruns uh, in continuous integration to kind of keep tabs on things day to day. So you just showed a, a chronograph plot kind of similar to this, um, but this is a different example um, from a, a really small, uh, just like six or so, um, data IDs uh, for two different data sets. We have an HSC data set and um, the, a small subset of the DCAM data set that we run um, every night uh, in continuous integration. And what we, what we do every week when we have a meeting with um, the AP team is we go through and we, we find strange blips that have happened. So like on the right here, you can see that, oh, look, suddenly um, the number of sources, the ratio of the number of sources jumped up uh, you know, what happened? And so we took a look at, oh, well, it turns out that that, that jump corresponded exactly to when um, I merged a ticket that changed how we were scaling the variance plane. We started scaling that in the difference image instead of in the template image when we were doing difference imaging, um, which is something that we thought algorithmically was going to make sense. But um, obviously, it was going to change our metrics. So we were able to kind of go back and add little annotations um, so that we could understand the source of all these different blips. And sometimes, you know, tickets get merged and they don't have an appreciable change or any given metric. But you can, um, once you add an annotation, it shows up on all the graphs. So it lets you kind of get a holistic view of what's going on. And on the left there, we, we also look at the timing. So this is kind of cool because you can see how much time each of the different tasks takes. So one of these is um, image difference task. One of them is uh, ISR task. Um, and a calibrate and characterize image and then doing the actual uh, difference imaging or the association pipeline at the end of it and how much time they take respectively. So if that gets out of whack, you can you know try to investigate that as well. Uh, next please. So a little bit, uh, I'll just say a couple words about the, the QA analysis um, that we've been doing when we run the AP pipeline. And one thing that we've been continuously refining is the, uh, the bad pixel flags. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, so the, the ones that I've plotted here in red are the ones that we are assuming are pretty much always like spurious bad sources. So if it's um, an interpolated thing, if it's saturated in the center of the source, if it's on the edge of the chip and you know things like that, then we can pretty obviously say that's not a real thing. We don't want to include it in our catalog or try to do science with it. Um, and what's, uh, what's interesting is that sometimes we look at our templates, we can actually see things like satellite streaks. So I've circled down here in purple. This is a, uh, this is a, a plot of all the, the different imaging sources in, um, in one of the visits. And a, 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 a stripe shows up. And when I went and I looked back at the template image that was used for that particular one, um, there, there indeed is a satellite that made it through into the template. So some of the work that um, Claire has been doing is going to let us have um, a, a new a flag for, for satellite streaks so that we don't have that winding up as a whole bunch of sources um, in our data sets, hopefully. It's been nice to, um, with the new Gen 3 middleware, to be able to kind of build template images on the fly if you want. 
Um, that's not how things will work when we're actually doing AP in like, you know, with actual Ruben data, we'll need to have templates kind of as an a priori input. Um, but for precursor data set analysis, it is really nice to have a giant pile of raw images say, make me a good seeing template and do the difference imaging as if that already existed um, and take a look at the output. Um, it's kind of lets you just do it all in one um, and, see, and see the results. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that we are starting to um, uh, inject some synthetic sources into our real data sets. And that is what Lee is gonna tell you about. A perfect segue. Thank you so much, Maggie. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Lee Kelvin. So another exciting thing we've been looking at more recently is uh, injecting synthetic sources into our uh, regularly processed data sets. Uh, so this is injecting known parametric profiles, for example, a CERSIC function or, or combination thereof, multiple CERSIC functions into real data and then using, uh, pushing all those data through the pipeline and then measuring the outputs. And those are really useful for QA because you know the truth, you know the true value that went in and you can measure the outputs and then contrast them to, to work out exactly what's going on. So you can see an example here on the left side of the screen uh, of a recent, uh, some recent work we've been doing with uh, Aaron Watkins and the LSST UK uh, Low Surface Brightness Working Group. Uh, the top left, you can see a, a, a slice from Hypers Prime Cam. Um, and in the middle, you can see we've injected a few uh, synthetic sources into that same region. And then at the bottom there, you can see, in this case, the impact that's had on the detection mask. Um, and this, this kind of work has been really useful in, in developing our thoughts with regards um, how we look at things like sky subtraction, how we look at things like source detection and so on. Um, in the middle, you can see some uh, lovely figures that Sophie Reed and others have been working on, uh, looking at, in this case, uh, contrasting the known uh, input magnitude to the measured output magnitude as a function of magnitude. So you get this lovely trumpet plot, and you can see as you get to faint magnitudes, of course, those the scatter increases, as you might expect. Um, but nevertheless, the, the median is, is pretty close bang on zero, which is very good. Um, on the right-hand side here, uh, the lower right corner, you can see an example of where we're going in terms of developing new metrics. So this figure shows the um, surface brightness at which the uh, measured um, radial profile of these injected synthetic sources begins to deviate by more than 10% from the known input radial profile. Um, so that's a really important number because it quantifies, it, it encodes a whole bunch of information, particularly with regards, for example, sky subtraction, as I mentioned. Um, so developing metrics like this uh, we, we hope to uh, add more of these in the future and begin tracking them uh, to, to give a, a closer view on, on exactly how well we're performing in our pipelines. And I will just say we had a really successful uh, synthetic source injection workshop a few months back. And uh, as an output of that, we are now developing new SSI uh, input data sets that we hope to begin regularly processing uh, very soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lee. So now I would like to go through some new features that are now part of the science pipelines that you will want to be aware of. <clears throat> so first and foremost, we re completely refactored the science pipelines to run on Gen 3 middleware in the last year. This was an enormous undertaking. And I, I wanted to take this moment to thank the science pipelines team for their for their, their perseverance in enduring many an, an, an empty quantum graph when I know writing shiny new algorithms is way more fun than refactoring. So thank you. It was worth it though, because Gen 3 middleware makes the pipelines more modular, reproducible, flexible. It makes things possible that were impossible with Gen 2. For example, um, saving multiple flavors of coads in the same output collection. This has Pave the now that we've broken three free from the limitations of Gen 2, this has really paved the way for new branches of the pipeline, including the, the DIA pipeline for DRP, which I mentioned will be in DP 0.2, and um, regions of maybe regions of the, the next HSE, the final HSE data release. With the version 22 of the pipelines, Gen 2 is officially deprecated and is only going to be supported through New Year's. Um, please watch out on pipelines.lsst.io for information on Gen3 tutorials and information on how to convert your existing data flows to Gen3 
in the future. We've also now write out survey property maps during data release production in heel sparse format. Heel sparse is a sparse implementation of heel picks in Python written by Eli with his desk hat on and friends. It's supporting machinery, the visit summary tables has enabled some other features as well, including fancier selection of visits for co-edition and our output standardized visit and CCD visit parquet tables. What's next is for, as a precursor for small cell edge-free constant PSF co-ads that will support shear measurement, we need to write out the artifact rejection masks as intermediate data products and the survey property maps will account for those and include those in the metrics in the quantities as well. We now use Scarlet by default during co-ad measurement. Those of you who are familiar with our HSC data releases will recognize this population of galaxies that are very faint, but get assigned a very large size. With Scarlet turned on, this population gets assigned a much more realistic size and more realistic flux. You can expect some version of Scarlet to be included in the DP0.2 pipeline. We now mask streaks identified by a kernel Huff transform algorithm on image differences during co-edition. Claire Saunders gave a talk about this at the satellite constellation session yesterday. If you're wondering what we mean by streaks. Next, so right now we're measuring, uh, we're running this during the artifact rejection loop within co-edition. Next steps are going to be to validate this to run during earlier parts of the pipeline, including the difference imaging stages. We now perform instrument signature removal and spectroscopic reductions from real data from the Rubin Observatory's lattice. Lattice is the spectrograph on the auxiliary telescope. And this has been instrumental in testing all sorts of parts of the, the pipeline. We're now automating calibration product production at the summit and can make and verify these daily calibrations with OCPS. And I'm gonna to have to move on despite in really enjoying watching this video, but take a look at the, at the link if you wanna watch more of this. The next, the next few topics we went into depth into at the algorithms workshop 18 months ago. And for that reason, we're going to spend a little bit more time on these than one slide I did for the previous new features. Josh Myers is over giving a talk at the active optics session right now. So I'm going to present his slides for him. So our big news here is that PIF is integrated into the pipelines. And this means that you can run a DRP or AP pipeline with PIF instead of the current default PSFX just by switching a couple config parameters. The advantage of PIF over PSFX is that PIF is state of the art. It solves several problems from experienced by both Ruben and Des. And most importantly, it is in active development. How's it doing now? In terms of PSF size and ellipticity residuals across the field of view, we already see comparable performance despite having done no tuning yet. So eventually when we, re when we tune the configuration, this will only improve the performance. In terms of uh, row stats, which are of particular interest to weak lensing, in particular row one, the ellipticity residual autocorrelation let me hang on. Sorry. Oh no. Okay. Um, that is unfortunate because I wanted to blink, <laughs> blink between these. Um, however, okay. So story is that um, we see a slight improvement with PIF with respect to PSFX. And again, once we do the tuning of the configuration of parameters, this will only improve. The advantage of having integrated a package that is in active development is that all the development is available to the pipelines. So 
Josh wanted me to highlight some concurrent activity on the full field of view PSF model from the DES side. So this is not work done by the science pipelines, but is work that is available to the science pipelines because of this integration work that Josh has done. Some recent developments here include characterizing the PSF size diffusion in tree rings and modeling mirror figure errors on the PSF. For more info, please see past presentations to the desk PSF working group. I'll take over from here. Uh, thanks, Lisa. So uh, I'll briefly talk about the improvement that we've done in Galaxy Photometry, particularly with uh, getting galaxy colors. So if you were at the algorithms workshop in March 2020, I think we went into detail about why getting total fluxes for galaxies, anything that's not a point source is basically impossible. But that's not necessarily the case for galaxy colors. You can still get consistent colors. And what we mean by consistent colors is that if you give the same weight to each star or each pixel in a galaxy uh, across all the bands, then you can get a consistent color, which is good for most of the science cases, especially those that involve photometric redshifts. So that includes weak lensing, star formation history, et cetera, where colors are sufficient. It's not necessarily helpful with uh, studies that involve uh, stellar masses, but it's certainly helpful for a majority of science cases that uh, we're interested in. So at the same algorithms workshop, Konrad Kaikan gave a talk about the HAP algorithm, uh, which is uh, it stands for Gaussian Aperture and PSF Photometry Algorithm. Um, and he also went into detail about its performance in the Kilo Degree Survey. A one-line summary for, of the algorithm for those who are not familiar with it, it's an aperture photometry algorithm, as the name suggests. It accounts for PSF variations, both spatial variations and across the bands, so that it can return colors that are largely invariant of the seeing or any observing conditions. So this is particularly suited well for galaxy colors, but not for total magnitudes because uh, the aperture is Gaussian and not a top hat one. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Lisa. So since the algorithms workshop, this has now been implemented in the Rubin Science Pipelines and it's uh, run regularly during the uh, regular pre-processing data that Yusra mentions. And this will be in the catalogs uh, that we produce for DP 0.2 and the uh, uh, fourth HSPDR4 for uh, HSC. Um, so we're still in the stage of uh, validating this. So I think the initial comparisons on the DC2 image simulations look pretty well. So this is a figure from Eli Rykoff where for his selection of red galaxies, a comparison between the measured colors and true uh, colors are really promising. And what is also nice is that the error estimates from the half algorithm are much more accurate than uh, what we have currently for the C model algorithms. There are still some minor issues that we are uh, ironing out, but by the time we get it to a uh, large repressing runs, we, we are really hopeful that it will all be sorted out. Next slide. So, so if you notice the plot in the previous slide was mainly for the red galaxies, a color-color comparison for all galaxies is not that meaningful, especially when galaxies have color gradients because the half colors are uh, designed to be or, or will be different from what you'd get by subtracting total magnitudes. Um, that's just because of the way we uh, weight things differently. But nevertheless, this has enough information to obtain photometric redshifts accurately. That still needs to be validated and uh, we plan on validating this in conjunction with DESK where we we see how well we can recover the uh, photometric redshifts and also work with the different photometric redshift codes that can produce this reasonably well. Um, so this will all be done on the DC2 simulations, hopefully prior to DP 0.2 processing or in the worst case, uh, as a part of the DP 0.2 processing. Um, so that's pretty much from it. Back to you, Lisa. 
I'll take over here and talk about uh, image differencing, which is one of the core algorithms for alert production, but as Jester mentioned also uh, in, in the data releases as well. Um, I'm Eric Bohm, I'm the alert production science lead. Um, the Where we've been, uh, a little more than a year ago at the algorithms workshop, we described uh, the status of image differencing. Uh, our core implementation uh, is a sort of classical Lard and Lupton uh, image differencing, uh, but we've added a new, what we call a decorrelation afterburner uh, that accounts uh, for the covariances when you have noise in the template image. Uh, this is related to uh, the so-called Zogi algorithm, uh, which provides sort of similar benefits, uh, but solves, solves a problem in Fourier space and so there's sort of a different set of trade-offs there, for example, in crowded fields. Um, so the plot on the right is um, we went through and labeled a large number of uh, image difference uh, five sigma DIA sources, um, um, candidates that showed up uh, in the difference image and labeled them by their sort of morphology. Um, and those suggested that uh, without any sort of um, real bogus scoring or flag filtering or anything else, uh, we're getting very raw uh, artifact to real ratios of about four to one. Uh, and that compares uh, favorably uh, to the experience of a lot of other surveys uh, that have used image differencing at scale. Next slide. So since then, uh, we've done uh, quite a bit of work. Uh, you see the folks here uh, who've sort of uh, led that effort, uh, Gabriel Kovacs, Ian Sullivan, you heard from Meredith earlier, and uh, Ken Herner. Uh, and our focus has been uh, sort of on trying to stress test these algorithms and find uh, the challenging cases uh, in terms of uh, scale and variety and, uh, and so on. And so we've expanded from uh, the uh, DECAM HITS data set that you heard about earlier. We're also now processing uh, HSC Cosmos. We're processing uh, a bulge data set with DECAM uh, for crowded field testing, as well as the uh, simulated DC2 images. And so all of those give us a slightly different look uh, at the performance of our algorithms and, and uh, let us uh, make sure that we're not um, overfitting or tuning too much to, to one specific camera. Um, so as I mentioned, we, uh, we've done some crowded field testing uh, with some, some good initial results. And we're also especially focused on performance of image differencing in the case when the template has poor seeing. Um, we've added, uh, as uh, just uh, described uh, earlier, um, uh, synthetic source injection. So the plot on the right is quite fresh. This is uh, the completeness of uh, different image sources in HSC Cosmos by band. Uh, and so you can see we're, we're starting out at the bright end, uh, quite near the sort of 90% uh, threshold that is our target. Uh, we're falling off a little, a little too early before the uh, Six Sigma limiting magnitude indicated by uh, by the vertical shaded bands, uh, but this plot is just a, a day or two old, so uh, we're eager to dive in and, and investigate here. Uh, again, as mentioned also, we spent quite a bit of time sort of refactoring to take advantage of the new capabilities provided uh, by Gen 3 and quite a number of algorithmic bug fixes. Next slide. So where we're going, um, we uh, fake insertion and this uh, sort of human scanning of cutouts, I think are both gonna be critical for us to get a clear sense of our completeness and purity going forward. So we're working to uh, bring those into sort of regular routine productions. We have um, snapshot performance sort of all the time. Uh, we have a new hire who's gonna begin developing uh, the real bogus infrastructure and classifier. And uh, we're gonna continue uh, uh, testing and refining the image differencing algorithm the special focus on sort of the commissioning and early operations, early science period, uh, to make sure that uh, AP is ready to generate good science as soon as we have those images. Uh, and so that speaks in particular to things like uh, understanding how best to generate those incremental templates that we heard so much about earlier this week, uh, as well as making sure uh, we're prepared for the sort of wider range of seeing that we're gonna have when we're sort of building templates from just a few images. Uh, and then the last piece that we're going to be spending a fair bit of time on uh, is making sure that our uh, science pipeline code is ready to integrate uh, with the full real-time processing system, the production databases, uh, allergent distribution, and so on. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Um, my name is Siegfried Egger, and uh, I have the pleasure of uh, guiding you through our progress that we made with the solar system processing. 
So uh, at this time last year, um, we had, uh, in essence, all the kind of building blocks of the solar system uh, processing pipeline as standalone components um, that were being tested. So in essence, we have three main components. One is uh, what we call association, that's uh, uh, linking or not really linking, but uh, finding known solar system objects in the field of view. Then we have linking of solar system objects. This is, uh, in essence, finding which observations belong to new objects and uh, submitting those to the Minor Planet Center is kind of the third block um, because the Minor Planet Center um, kind of can forward most of the um, newly discovered objects to the folks who do follow up, um, do nice orbit fitting, and uh, we can extract orbits from them. So most of those things were uh, in uh, sort of a, an elementary uh, complete form as a standalone. Um, and uh, moreover, uh, what we planned to do uh, this time last year was to have a simulated uh, LSST data set for solar system objects, uh, because um, solar system uh, was not part of, of DP0, and uh, we just want to make sure that the solar system community uh, doesn't lose a step uh, compared to other solar system science collaborations. And uh, on the right, you can see um, parts of the team that we had, um, uh, Mario, uh, Joachim, Nate, uh, and, and I. And I would like to give a special uh, shout out to our undergraduate researchers at the University of Washington, uh, Sam Cornwall and Aidan Barris, who did really a lot of heavy lifting on the simulated data set. And uh, if you're in need for a uh, very talented graduate student, you know where to find them now. Next slide, please. Um, that being said, um, we kind of uh, went forward and uh, tried to implement, or in essence implemented, uh, some of the, uh, of the pipelines into a pipeline task. Um, so the Solar System Object Association pipeline, for instance, uh, we are just uh, uh, getting ready to, to run this as pipeline tasks. And I'd like to also give a shout out to Chris Morrison, who is uh, really super helpful uh, in this uh, process. Um, it's not quite done yet, but uh, we are on a very good way of, of getting this uh, done, uh, there need to be some uh, sort of final design decisions um, that we need to make in a couple of uh, next months where all this stuff is going to run and um, whether or not we need online access for some of parts of this process. As far as solar system linking goes, um, we have uh, a beautiful algorithm that takes advantage of both the latest uh, developments in um, solar system science linking, plus what LSSD is doing anyway, namely um, taking um, these uh, pairs of observations uh, per night over a couple of nights. And uh, this is working beautifully um, on simulated data sets. Um, so now what we need to do is to make sure that uh, we are stress testing this properly um, with weird um, outlying um, comets or binary asteroids or things like that, just to make sure that everything works fine. Um, one nice thing is that HelioLink is now capable of ingesting trail source data as well. And the reason for this is because we had uh, our very Zach Langford at the University of Washington who uh, we could um, motivate to spend a little time off exoplanets and work for us. And uh, he uh, and Mario Rich really uh, put a lot of effort into getting a trail source fitting into the science, LSC science pipeline. And uh, this has been a huge success. Um, they not only did that, but also made sure that this is computationally feasible um, with really very clever algorithms. So uh, shout out to Zach as well uh, and Mario for their efforts there. And um, given that effect, um, we have linking uh, also. And the last thing that I wanted to point out in the previous slide was that we also have a simulated LST data set for solar system objects for the solar system science collaboration um, that uh, we presented at the last solar system sprint. Um, the links are on the slides um, if you're interested in how to access that. Next slide, please. Um, from here, what's left to do is to make sure that uh, all the pipeline elements are properly implemented into the LSST stack, into the LSST pipeline. Um, we also would like to um, go back to the uh, Minor Planet Center and after running a pretty nice uh, first simulated data exchange with the Minor Planet Center last uh, September, uh, where we found some uh, that most of the things actually worked pretty well, except some of the things um, were uh, still require a little work. For instance, uh, they ran out of preliminary designations just because we kind of sent them so much data. Um, that was pretty funny. Um, so we, we're gonna do this again and it's uh, planned for the fall. And uh, finally, um, the Rubin Euclid derived data products um, uh, for the solar system uh, report is also being compiled now um, together with Leanne so that we are sure that uh, we can take advantage of both uh, the collaboration between um, Rubin and external um, other missions as well. Thanks. Back to you, Yusra. Thank you, Siegfried. Okay.
the algorithms workshop included a large number of topics and we couldn't possibly give you in-depth updates on every single one in just a 40 minute talk. So those topics, including astrometric calibration, photometric calibration, shear measurement, et cetera, background estimation. Uh, we've got two members ready to answer questions about them if you are curious. So um, you've heard about what's next for each of the algorithms previously in this talk. What's next on the for the subsets for the algorithms that were not covered previously is that uh, for photometric calibration, the, the limiting factor right now is background estimation and next steps are to implement a compensated aperture flux plugin designed by Robert. Fitting stellar parallax and proper motion by integrating GBDES in our astrometric fitting code. Developing an iterative single frame image characterization pipeline now possible in Gen 3 described in DMTN 120, uh, 172. And I think I, I did mention one of these previously in the talk, but next steps towards small cell coeds for shear measurement are tracking uh, and improving the interpolation in single frame processing. For more information in each of these topics, please check out the project plans that we outlined in the algorithms workshop talks. Mo the, the, the information there is still, still correct and still represents our, our plans and what we think of as state of the art. Please post questions on community. There's a few other sources for more information as well. Well, the what we have to build over the next few years is largely set. The, the how depends on state of the art, what the state of the art is. And we are very, um, you know, we're very open to feedback from, from you. So please, please send us our, send us your metrics and feedback on the data products that we've released in the previous data, data releases. And, uh, yeah, and, fi and finally, I'd like to thank the whole Science Pipelines team again for, for all the hard work and results that I showed earlier in this talk. I know, I know this was a wild year, but we <laughs> somehow managed to get a lot done, so thank you. Excellent. And we are ready for questions now. Thanks, Yisra, and everyone who presented and everyone who did all the work behind all this. Um, we already have a few questions in Slack, but we have time for, for many more. I think we have a good amount of time left. Um, so I noticed there was a handful of questions about um, synthetic source injection. So maybe Lee could um, uh, summarize the question and the answer to a few of these um, all together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there have been some great uh, Q&A going on on Slack. So just, just stepping through. Um, so we had a great question from Sir Hood about um, uh, at what, uh, what kind of recovery rates are we getting with our synthetic sources? Um, that's a really great question. Uh, so Sophie Reed actually re replied with a, with a link to one of the plots that she's been generating, um, which, which looks at this. So I encourage everyone to go and look at that plot. Um, but uh, so uh, we're recovering about 50% of sources uh, down to about um, 24.3 magnitude in the, in the I band. But this number obviously uh, is in flux. We haven't finalized our um, ultimate uh, synthetic source injection uh, catalogs as yet. So these are things we will continue to evolve as we go ahead. But nevertheless, we have a whole bunch of plots like that, which we can we can provide for people to look at if they're, if they're interested. Um, we had another question from, from Dara Norman about um, what is the main focus of our SSI efforts? Um, and uh, they correctly say, you know, LSB science, low surface brightness science is one of the main uh, aspects that we've been looking at. However, we hope that SSI is useful for a whole bunch of uh, use cases. Um, I, I also mentioned things like sky estimation, background estimation, or um, source detection, deblending, blending things like that. So there's a whole bunch of things that we hope to be able to look at, and, and we encourage others to use these outputs to look at for their own use cases as well. 
Um, and then finally, there was some discussion about where the code lives. Um, and the link is on Slack uh, from, from Mario uh, there. It's the insert fakes um, package. And if you need assistance on that, uh, Sophie Reed's written a community post on how to interact with, with that code base. And there is some discussion about how that um, code base will evolve in the future. We have some plans for it in terms of uh, spinning it off into its own repo and uh, perhaps merging in tools from, from other repos as well. So there'll, there'll be some discussion ongoing about that in the future. Great. Um, so I see another uh, a question from Sugata about international contributions. So maybe do you want to ask that ask that live for the sake of the Zoom viewers? Um, yeah, I can do. Uh, thanks, Colin. Um, so my question is um, about the uh, the the gap uh, photometry um, uh, measurement pipeline that I think Arun mentioned. Um, so essentially, there are there are a couple of um, in kind contributions embedded within galaxies, uh, which are planning to offer photo Z catalogs. So it would be useful if they could also interact with you guys about using gap. And I was just wondering how that should, uh, you know, how we should, how we can make that happen, essentially. Yes, I think, um, yeah, we'll start with discuss a bit more about how the or does the course have to be modified, if I, which I think we should be a bit to handle the half colors at the precision required. And I think uh, you can definitely uh, put me in touch with them either on Slack or on email. And I think we also have like a dedicated DM half channel, which we currently use mostly for QA testing, but there will also be a place to ask questions about the algorithm in general. Great. I'll put them in touch with you guys on that. Thank you. So there's a few more questions about um, uh, Eric's discussion of uh, real to fake ratios. So maybe Eric, if you want to summarize those again for the anybody viewing the video after the fact. Um, sure. Um, so there were just a question, a couple of questions of whether the uh, four to one fake to, uh, artifact to real ratio uh, is before or after flag filtering, uh, and that was before flag filtering uh, for the purposes uh, uh, using using deckham hits. Um, some flag filtering, uh, just very coarse, uh, takes it down to about three to one as of a year ago, uh, and then we were chatting a little bit uh, again about. Uh, how that compares on HSC, and I think um, we should know uh, very soon. I have the numbers, I just didn't uh, get them pulled together in time. Um, uh, I think the raw ratios for, for HSC out of the box look a little higher, but the, they seem to be um, pretty characteristic, and I expect flags will pick up a greater proportion of them. Okay, great. Um... So I'm trying to see if we got anything that was left unanswered. Um, we have brought Josh Myers into the Slack channel to give more details on, on tree rings when he becomes available. Um, and I think Mario got answers to his questions about processing timelines. Um, so is there anything else people want to ask questions about? I think we still have a few minutes. Ah, I see a hand raise from Mike Jarvis. Go ahead. Since no one's asking, I'll, I'll ask something. So, so PIF was integrated, obviously that's close to my heart, um, but I was curious, are there any other PSF estimation software um, packages that are planning to be integrated at some point? You know, the, the GOP, however you pronounce that, or, or any others? App doesn't do PSF estimation by itself. It needs to be provided a PSF model. So, um, but however, it produces well, it produces individual footprints with cautionized uh, PSFs, which can be used for any other uh, uh, measurements if needed. But doesn't provide a, it doesn't persist or provide an entire image with uh, homogeneous PSF. 
but that was interesting to anybody. I think the answer is no, Mike, we trust you. And I don't want to work on the guts of PSFX anymore. Okay, last call for questions then. Okay, I see one more that just popped up about providing a feedback loop for improvement on documentation and tutorials. Uh, Yusura, maybe that's a answer for a question for you. Yeah, but okay, so there are dot okay, so there's there's a lot of documentation and tutorials that are written by um, different folks and science pipelines folks write some of them and the new pre ops community engagement team is collecting some others that will provide tutorials for the data preview zero. Um, so I guess my question is, it depends on which tutorials that you're talking about. I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about notebooks, but yes, we, if they're on GitHub, we welcome pull requests to keep those up to date. For, for documentation in pipelines.lsst.io, well, we, we know that it leaves a lot to be desired and it's a, it's something that we are actively working on, but we, we would very much welcome feedback on specific pieces that are missing or parts that are out of date. And um, yes, we, we wanna hear, hear your feedback on documentation. Thank you for that. Um, I would just say, as long as we know where to direct that outside of pull requests, um, that I think that's perfect. Pull requests and on community, I would say. Community, okay. The best right. options. Yeah, that's that's definitely our preferred input route for um, for general uh, topics like that. Um, so I see no other hands or questions in Slack. So I think uh, I think we can finish up for the day. Um, thanks again to everyone who presented and wrote slides and and did the plots behind the slides, etc. Um, or did you, sir? Do you have anything else you want to add? Nope. Thank you all for for joining to listen to about science pipelines. Okay, great. See you all later. Bye.